Alex, Izzy, and Will. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Um, when I fought that green-haired kid, my hands hurt for like two months. Because you punched him in his face. My hands, so sore. What was Chris's last name? Matinho. Matinho, yeah. And then that last fight before this one, I broke, or I fractured my thumb. My thumb. Yeah, it wasn't too long. Yeah, I was here. Uh, I was here for that one too. That was sick. Yes. He is one of the toughest humans though I've ever, I've ever seen though. Yeah, I still don't understand. Every watch that fight back, I'm like, what? Yeah, like you hit most people with those. Like I've seen you, I said you had walk offs or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Sometimes I, mean? I think some, like literally, some people are so stupid that their brains don't shut off. I think that kid was just, shut off, right? yeah, there was just like, <laughs> just kept walking forward. Some people are smart enough, they're like, all right, let's not think about more damage. Nah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a bro, man. man. man good to meet you, yeah, good to meet you. Yeah. That's the one you got to watch now, Sean. He's going to ask you some nasty. I'll answer. I'll answer. Man, <laughs> listen. I'll answer whatever you I got. I don't know. You wild. How wild are you? Yeah, we're wild. Let's get it. <laughs> you been to Miami Tootsies? Uh, where at? It's a strip club. Miami Tootsies, the big-ass strip club in Miami. I don't think I have. Oh, OK. And it's just fleets of bad ones. Oof. <laughs> so I took him in there. They throwing money, throwing money. I'm like, God damn, you can't throw money at everybody. Like, you got to pick one. Like, make somebody feel special. <laughs> no, I don't even know all of them bad. I'm like, yeah. God damn, you can't do that. Uh, I waste up all my money. They're, they're good, too. They make you feel like you have a little connection. You're like, oh, maybe, maybe she maybe likes me. Maybe she likes me. me. Yeah. Maybe she, maybe she likes me. They that, don't. That's the, they wor don't. That's the worst phrase in the world. Maybe she likes Same me. Okay. <laughs> Hold up. Limitless, bigger stomach cow pinning it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless, bigger stomach cow pinning it. I fought the head to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, so it's Sunday morning, bro. Saturday, uh, after the fight, Pedro Munoz. Uh, we're all upset that it ended. Uh, in the way it did, man. Yeah. Welcome to the pivot, Channing Crowder, Fred Taylor, myself. Hey, y'all, like, subscribe, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Check it out, um, bro. I, I, I think it's just crazy, right? We're, we're in Vegas, uh, UFC 276. Your first opportunity to fight a top 10 guy. You know, you said you originally said, look, until y'all start paying me that type of money, I'm not trying to jump up and do that. You get an opportunity to do it. How do you feel when it ends the way it did last night? Yeah, now that I've had this much time to look back, right after I was just devastated. I just wanted to cry. I was like, are you serious? Because I did about 12 weeks, like three months, dialed in, locked in. I'm fighting Pedro Munoz July 2nd. Like, it was a long camp. And for it to end like that, it really sucks. But if, if I could take, what I could take away from it was he was a top 10 guy. He, he fought Jose Aldo, Dominic Cruz, Frankie Edgar. Close fights with all of them. He landed zero shots to my head, landed zero shots to my body, landed a couple leg kicks, but I, I checked most of those. Check, like, if you kicked my leg and I checked it, it would hurt you really bad. I felt his shins and his feet were landing on a couple of them, where, I, like, those kicks were damaging him very bad. Like, so some of those on the scorecards, it looked like he kicked me more than he did. Right. Um, but what I could take away from that fight is it was a top 10 guy, I broke him mentally. He was looking for a way out. The nut shot didn't, wasn't a nut shot. It was on the belt line. Belt. It was a nice body shot. If you get hit with a body shot, and it, you can pretend it's a nut shot, take your time, get, you know, uh, the eye poke. I didn't really feel like I poked him in the eye. <sighs> I don't know. It, it, I was patient. I was landing good shots. I was finding my range. Um, I was about to take over that fight, and he, he just found a perfect way out. DC and I did Sports Center uh, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And with Israel Adesanya on the card, uh, Alexander Volkanovsky, uh, with all these people, our segment was about you, right? And so DC's kind of going through what he thinks the fight's gonna be like and all those things. And the point I made was, and I say that, you can say this, right? You say this about people all the time. I was like, y'all need to stop looking at him and watch him fight. Right, I was like the the, the tats, right, the, the the hair, all those things. Y'all don't see those things. I say y'all see those things and miss the patience, right? Mm -hmm. Miss the technique, the skill. But when I look at that, 
How did a kid from Montana turn into Sugar Shaw? Well, I appreciate you even saying that because there is a lot. I like I say like I'm one of the best strikers in MMA. And I've had, it's the patience, the timing, you know, the training. I, I do put a lot into it, and I do get like looked at as, for whatever reason, different. My hair's crazy, tattoos and stuff. But I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that. Um, I don't know. Just being from Montana, there wasn't a commission, so we were allowed to fight. Like I started fighting when I was 16. I grew up playing basketball, soccer, football, baseball, just you know, the, all the other sports. I was just an, a good athlete. Um, and then when I started kickboxing, you didn't have to get good grades to, to, you know, I couldn't really play basketball or football anymore. You had to get good grades, and it's just like I wasn't, I didn't like the whole team thing. I wanted like one-on-one -on -one stuff. So I started kickboxing when I was 16, and uh, just really liked it. Was naturally good at it. Uh, once I turned 18, I did MMA and we were allowed to fight. Like I fought three times in one month because there's no commission. It, there was, it's just Montana. Every, there was a lot of people who would accept fights. I was fighting guys that weren't very good, but I was knocking them out. So I built this confidence of, I had this confidence. I was like, damn, I'm, I'm good. I'm knocking these guys out. I was delusional though, because I didn't know there was other levels. I was fighting guys from Montana who sucked. Right. So when I moved to Phoenix, and I started training with guys in the UFC. Like I got whooped. Bad. I really? travel. I went down to Phoenix for like ten days to ch check it out, and uh, eye opening. I, I, every single practice, I left crying. I was like, "Holy cow! I'm not nearly where I thought I was." Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I wanted to become something, which was my at that point was like the only thing I could do was get in the UFC. That's how I was gonna get famous and rich. That's what I wanted. Like when I was little, for whatever reason, was I was gonna have to go back to Montana. I saved up $2,000, drove down, and just lived in Phoenix and, and made it happen. But I think growing up in Montana, I just got super confident knocking out like guys that sucked. But it was, it was like an important part of my uh, career. But coming from a small town, you could have tucked it in and quit and, and went back to Montana. It's only 32000 Yeah. in your city, right? Yeah. Something Why like didn't that. you? I don't know. I just knew in my head, I'm like, I'm... I'm smart in like a athletic sense to where like I can learn techniques. I'm like, if I, if these guys got that good, I can get that good. And I was gonna go back to do Montana and like do what? I didn't have, I wasn't going to college. I knew that in like third grade, I hated school. I was like, I'm, school sucks. Um, so I didn't know, I didn't have any other route. Like it was make it in like, I knew even when I was like 18, 19, if you would ask me like, will you be in the UFC? Will you be one of the biggest stars? I would said 100% yes. I still have those doubts, like, I'd, like after sparring, I'd get whooped and stuff, like, I still have those doubts, but deep down I knew that if I could, if I would just stay consistent, two a days, two a days, two a days, two a days, that I was capable of getting to the level where I'm now. Who, who were some of the guys that inspired you? It was actually, I didn't really start watching, like I started training for a couple of years before I even really watched fights. Um, I kind of started watching more consistently, actually, when Connor kind of blew up. Yeah. So that was like someone I was like, I was like, damn, that's kind of what I was envisioning me doing. But it was cool. It was cool to watch him go through it. And now I'm kind of feel like I'm, I'm 27. I'm just. I think he got signed to the UFC when he was like 26, 27. And like, so I'm in that stage where I was first watching Connor blow up. And I've, I you know, I've learned a ton from Connor, what to do, what not to do. But yeah, pro probably Connor was was like someone that I looked up to and like watched every interview. Like, what, he was, you know, dressing nice. People like, well, why, what, why do they want to watch him? He's good at talking, good at performing. That, that, that's the main thing. Is you have to be good at performing. You can talk good, dress good, but if you can't win fights, doesn't matter. Do you matter. guys have a personal relationship, you and Connor? No, I've only had one conversation with him. He was buzzed up. He was pretty buzzed up. He got a thick accent when he's. he's, he's <laughs> well, got you got a game or something? Like, what, what yeah, at the what Cowboys the game. Proper, proper 12. <laughs> yeah, he had a, I, I did not understand what he was saying. It was so loud, too. So I had a, only had one short interaction with him. Um, but I'd love to hop on his Lamborghini and get buzzed up with him. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you hate the no contest? Do you hate the, like, the. Because, like you're saying, you, you don't think it was eye poke, but the world looks at it as. It was an eye poke, so it's a no contest. Like, you were on that main stage, the world to see you, and it was a, the no contest. Like, I, I would feel worse about it if I did, felt like I actually, like, really poked him. And I've been reading on the comments and on everything, and, like, I, a lot of people are like, I mean, Pedro's not a pussy. That's what, that's, like, the narrative. Like, he quit. But I do feel like he did quit. I feel like I mentally broke him, so I don't feel like the no contest. I had a loss on my record too, and I claimed that like I feel like I'm 16 and 0. I feel like I won that fight. 
Like you, like you said, you've already said it twice, two or three times in the interview that you broke him. Like, yeah. Yeah. when you're fighting a guy, y'all are locked up. I, I yeah. fought in the streets, but I ain't fight like you <laughs> fight. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm about 72 and four. Stop lying. <laughs> I am, and my sister's the only, my sister's the only record. ones that ever really whooped my fucking ass. <laughs> 72 and four. Yeah, I'm about 72 and four. Not bad. But I, I done fought in the streets, but yeah. like, do you, like when you when you look across, can you can you look a guy in the eye and know that you broke him? At the end of the first round, going into the second round, I feel like uh, I feel like some of those leg kicks he threw when I checked him really really hurt his feet and his shins. That uh, and he literally didn't hit me in the face or the body once. So going into that second round, I felt like he was slowly starting to like. It takes a lot to break someone, especially at that level and the guys he's fought. So. I think I was in the process of breaking him slowly, um, but yeah, I, I definitely feel like I you did. Love, you love that? It felt good. It's hard <laughs> to break another human being that's also training to fight you. But that's the goal. I, usually, I don't even break someone. I just knock them out. You know, there's a difference between mentally breaking them and completely shutting their lights out. Like they're both equally satisfying. We've gotten to see you, bro. We got walk offs. Right, uh, we got to see you shoot the J mm. a lot after a lot of your knockouts. But we were talking earlier, and I was saying, man, you know, you have been so successful. And we talked to DC as well, and DC was saying, you know, the last time uh, he fought Jones, he was crawling up his stairs, right, in, in pain, just trying to get to the fight. Uh, you fought uh, Chris Matuno. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, I've never seen a person get hit in the face that much and yeah. keep walking through and keep trying and keep trying to fight. What type of injuries have, have you had in your career that makes you say, okay, you know what? I got to keep building this brand. I had to keep building this name because this job's not forever. Yeah, I, I've, I've been training for about 11 years. I completely quit sparring outside of camp. Like I will not spar until I have a fight booked and I'll spar eight weeks out. My brain, I've had bad concussions and that's the, having a bad, I mean, I'm sure you guys have had bad concussions yeah. where you're like, I'm laying in my room, can't look at my phone, turn the lights off. Like, those are scary. And then it really makes you think, like, damn, what if I could just, what if I'm just ne never go back to just normal, my normal brain? Like, that's terrifying. It's horrible. So I don't spar outside of camp. Um, the fact that I got through this fight with literally not getting hit, hit in the head, that makes me more happy than anything. Um, but injuries-wise, like, my second fight in the UFC, um, I threw a head kick, and then when I landed, I went to throw a right hand, and my foot snapped. I had a Liz Frank surgery. That was pretty. That was pretty gnarly. That one hurt, like actually hurt for like two years. Um, last fight before this one fractured my thumb. wasn't really that bad. Um, I've been pretty lucky with with injuries, uh, just concussions. And usually a lot of the concussions you get are from training leading up to the fight. Like that's where people really screw up. Is, you know, they're fighting in the gym. Like they're getting paid thousands of dollars, but really you're just sparring. It's just a Saturday, right. trying to get ready for a fight. That's where I've re I feel like my training camps, I've got them so dialed in that uh, that's what sets me, like, makes me different than most fighters. I really got it dialed in. How scary, though, when you, when you do have those concussions and you are dealing with those things, I think that sometimes, you know, I've been asleep in the middle of the field before, you know what I'm saying? They woke up, I call it taking a prom picture, when they're walking you off the field <laughs> like this, like this, holding you, but not not remembering what led up to it, not yeah. remembering ever being on the ground or any conversations uh, that I have. And then going in the locker room and watching the game continue to be played. And my thought was always like, man, I was just laying in the middle of that field. They moved me. It's like I was never there, right? Yeah. And so with you, how you said, you know, you watched Connor and the different things that he did to build a brand. And you said, I always knew I wanted to make a lot of money mm. and be famous. Yeah. When, when you look at the fight game, what do you do to utilize the, the, the attributes and skills you have a different way. I mean, you got podcasts, you know, that you do. You showed us on DC and RC, the Lamborghinis look like Skittles, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying, in the garage. What are you doing to set yourself apart from that standpoint? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, you know, leveraging the UFC's platform. They have a massive platform, one of the biggest sports in the world right now, and it's growing fast. So for me to be able to leverage their platform and put on the performances I am, and then to translate that over, like, my social media is as big as it is because of the UFC. D doing merch, I remember he's 16, 17 years old, we were doing our own merch, like, so I've, it's, the merch is something I always liked doing. It was never just like, oh, I could just sell, I have fans, I'll just sell, sell clothes. So the merch was something that I was passionate about and, and genuine, I liked being a part of the merch, the design, the creative, all that stuff. Um, 
then the podcast, yeah, Tim and I started a podcast like four years ago and it was just something, it's like, what, why not? Just an hour, an hour a week talk we'd see where it goes and we've been doing it consistently for a long time and that's slowly growing when i'm done fighting 37 38 years old i'd like to think that i'm going to be you know the pay-per-view king i want to have i think connor has six or seven of the top 10 pay-per-views of all time i'd like to think that i don't have to do anything outside the ufc the ufc money will last me forever but if not because you don't you know i get knocked out three times in a row my head hurts i'm done fighting like i won't push that if my head starts getting like, I'm not gonna push that. So yeah, doing all these other things outside of fighting is like security. Like, I, cause I have a, a little daughter now, yeah, one and a half. Exactly like, about that. that changes it, like changes stuff too. It makes me really think like, I, I gotta, I have to make sure my brain's good. You got, yeah, you got money like that? Like, they, they told me about the Skittles, Lamborghinis and all that <laughs> stuff. And we all got money, but Lamborghinis like, I can buy one, but I won't buy one. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I think a quarter million dollars is a waste of money on a car. You got money like that? Well, I mean, it's it could be looked at as a waste of money, but it's like, I, I mean, it's just gonna sit in my bank. I have investments. I have multiple houses. I have, you know, I have I have money in smart. Like, I've, I've got a lot of investments, houses, but if I have an extra couple hundred thousand just sitting there, you buy a Skittle Lamborghini. Well, you buy a regular Lamborghini and you wrap it. <laughs> but I wrapped it. <laughs> I wrapped it like the color of my merch, and the merch drop that month was fucking insane. Basically yeah, paid for the smart. Lamborghini. Paid for itself. Right. And then now all these other brands are looking at me like, damn, okay, he's not. This ain't gonna be cheap if we want to get sugar. Like, he's rolling around in Lamborghinis. He's flying. Pr like, I'm not a cheap. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it just helps the brand. Yeah. What was the the, the payout last night? Is is the money the same even in a no contest? Um, no. So you get your show money which Pedro and I both got. We showed up, we made weight, we fought. And then you'd get you your win money. But I don't want to because I have okay. a really good relationship with the UFC. Smart. And it's, you know, I sat down with Sean Shelby, the matchmaker who, who decides our contracts. And uh, I, do, I just feel like keeping that private is yeah, the best way to go cool. about it. Right. Um, but the UFC knows that I'm a draw and they, you know, pay me good considering I'm not top 10 or right. whatever so uh last night was a good night regardless if i don't get my win money mm -hmm. i'm still hoping the ufc will i have a really really good relationship with dana hunter and sean the three like main guys so i'm you know maybe they do maybe they depending on how they saw the fight i know they got an extra whatever my win money is like i know like that won't hurt them right it'll help me a little right. bit it'd be nice but it was a good it was a, overall it was a good weekend it was a good month june july leading up to the fight a lot of brand deals come in how about you know, speaking of brand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Officially, like, you know, partnered up with Happy Dad, which obviously you guys know. Yeah. I believe in that brand. That's a huge brand. They're doing great things. Um, and, you know, potentially more things to come with the Nelk Boys. So, right. so yeah, it was leading up to the fight's always a really good month uh, for brand deals. Right. You you threw up the, the, the quotation when you said top 10. Yeah. Does that <laughs> frustrate or piss you off? Like, what's your mindset? I know I'm capable of... Like I guess I feel like I proved it yesterday. Like uh, I can compete with these guys. I don't know if where I'm gonna get ranked next, but the higher you get ranked, obviously the less guys you have to choose to fight mm, from, right, which right. kind of sucks because maybe this guy's injured, these guys are booked. It's like now I just wait, or I fight someone that doesn't really make sense. Um, so it doesn't really matter to me whether like if I was still ranked 13, I would I could care less. Right. Like the money really wouldn't change. So. RC RC mentioned the he mentioned the jumper thing. <laughs> And I'm checking out the tat yeah. on the side of your neck. That's the, the jumper tat? That was, yeah, I don't, I'm trying to think which fight. Oh, actually, right after I knocked out Eddie Wineland, that was the first time I did my colorful hair, and I hit him with that, and it was it was the first time I fought Apex, so there was no one there. It was right, like, during COVID. And uh, Tim was like, oh, it would have been cool if he would, like, pretend to hit a jump shot. So my next fight, two fights after that, then I knocked uh, Thomas Almeida out, yeah. which was a, that was a crazy knockout. Yeah. Laying on the back. Breath didn't stop it, jumped on top of him. I think that's when I first hit the jump shot. And uh, I don't know, whatever reason. I think I was uh, watching The Last Dance mm -hmm. on Netflix. Yeah. I was just feeling, I was like, right. that whole that whole fight camp, I pretty much binge watched it, so it was like a week. But uh, yeah, I think that's where it kind of came from. And then the tat, just the, the whole tat, movie. I just can, like, if I thought of a tattoo right now, like, oh, that'd be sweet, I'd go get it tomorrow. I don't really think too much into it, clearly. You look at where you are 
where you are now. And obviously, one, because of my job, but also because I just love the sport. You know, I like to follow you guys and kind of see what your life is like, right? And, you know, whenever you see a dude from Montana, when you're from New Orleans, it's always intriguing. Yeah. Right? Because, you know, I'm expecting you to walk in, you know, straight legs, barely bend your legs when you walk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Had a fresh, did a nice cut, the swoop joint, yeah. right? You're, you're totally, you're totally different from, than that. But watching you gift your father a watch, you know what I'm saying? Your little brother, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Give your moms a car. Yeah. You know, when you think about the fame and the things that, that come along with that, how important or, or how awesome has it been to be able to give back to your family in that way? Yeah, it's sweet. My whole family... Uh, mom, both brothers and sisters, I moved them all down. They all live in Arizona now, which is really cool because I was living there for like seven years by myself. And uh, the goal when I first moved there was like, I want to get my whole family moved down here. So now that they're all down here, yeah, in, in able to, you know, my mom's living at one of my houses, got my little brother and little sister, Prius. Not the craziest car, but hey, gas prices are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's, it's funny because that's the car they wanted. They're like, that's what, they want the best gas. Um, so yeah, it feels really good to be able to give back to them and uh, give my dad a Rolex. He'll send me a picture of his watch like all the time, just like. That's a big dog. Oh, he went to yeah. it. I'm surprised you don't that's, have that's one too, Fred. That's a big Fred. dog. I'm, Fred, he, I'm letting Daniel wear one. Hey, he normally he normally rocks two at one time, man. I rarely wear one. You want that one? <laughs> Hell no. That's a little Casio camo camouflage. Fire. Track your sleep. Uh, hey, you know, hey Chan, I forgot yeah. to tell you, Casio yeah, got new watches that look like the AP. Uh, Just Steve, like how much did it cost? Steve, I ain't gonna spend too much money. Steve now. gave me this one. Steve will do it. Shut up. Yeah, oh, first time wow. I met him, gave me this watch. Oh, wow. Like seventy-five thousand. And more he than gave that, it to huh? you. Yeah, gave it yeah. to me. Dang, yeah. I need better friends. Y'all ain't never give me no, no watch. Text. I'm looking for, you got the ESPN money. I'm retired. <laughs> no, I'm you retired. need to be giving out money. Y'all got all this bread. You got 17 businesses, your old lady do real estate. Listen, You're listen, doing listen, a ton. Listen, 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 listen. Don't, don't put all my shit in the street. You stand on the show all the don't time. Don't put my He's shit in the street. He's 74 and four or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. In his head. Hey, yeah. I don't He's had 17 that. knee surgeries, so he. Yeah, oh, yeah. You talking, about, I had, you talking about Liz Frank? I had Liz Frank on both my no feet. No shit. I know the shit. Them screws they put through that shit, that shit is a bitch. That was not fun. Yeah. yeah. Bro, the hair. Yeah. The pink. The green, the yeah. I, I see now I see the connection. Yeah. Like was that marketing or like what what created Be the... needing to be seen. Like we can all I, I think what separates me is my performances for like I I put on shows when I'm in the octagon, but even going a step further than that. I mean, like what else? Every time I show up to fight week, I have more media obligations than the champ. Than than the like I had the most media obligations this week. Probably because my hair's crazy. I have face, I'm just a character. And that people want to, you know, like that's, it, it is part of the marketing and being seen and so yeah. Do, do, all, do all fighters understand that? Because you, you bring up McGregor. Yeah. He understands selling a fight. Yeah. We're, 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 we're cool, we're cool with Floyd, we were Floyd last night. Mm -hmm. Like he understands selling a fight. Yeah. Do you, do you think that a lot of young fighters, cause obviously, you understand selling a fight. Yeah. Like, it, how how big a part of selling the fight, the marketing, and the performance is it equal? Like, what's that? What's that breakdown? Yeah, I, it's definitely equal for me. Um, I feel like I haven't really had the opportunity to sell a fight because I don't get pay per view points. Like, the, mm -hmm. I'm on all the pay per views, but in the contract, UFC is very like strict. The people that get pay-per-view points are the champ. Israel Adesanya got pay-per-view points. Jared Cannonier, who he fought, didn't. Mm. So like, I didn't get pay-per-view points. For, so when, that's, when I'm main event, I'm the man, that's when it's like, okay, let's see how I can sell a fight. Let's see how many pay-per-views I can get. Mm. Like, I, I'm curious last night how many pay-per-views they got. You know, that's... Oh, for you. I think I, I can sell a decent pay-per-view on my own right now. Um, but I want to be, yeah, I want, I want the big, like a million buys is crazy. That's, that's the goal eventually, and I'll build up to there. Like my first pay-per-view might not be a million, but eventually I want to, every single time I fight, like Jorge's in a position right now to where he, he fights, it'll probably get a million buys. Like that's, that's And without even being the champion, though. Like right. That's the other part. Right? Yeah, because obviously the, the Ben Askren knee, the Darren Till knockout, like the performances put him, got him there, and then his persona and his character people enjoy and invested in. Yeah, you know, so. like, it's so crazy, man. Like, you sit here, and I'm listening to you, and I've listened to a lot of the other stuff that you do, and there are stories, right? Like, you you have stories that you're like, oh, crazy. Like, he just lives a crazy life. But then you sit here, man, you come in with, with your legs crossed, and 
I could see how you see life in a very intelligent way and also the, the fight game. What are some of the things that you like to do that people might not think about, whether it's reading, you know, journaling, whatever yeah. it is, that kind of sets Sugar Sean apart from the persona? I started learning about meditation from, uh, well, Tim kind of introduced it to me too because he broke his jaw in his last, in the last fight he had four years ago. Uh, it was actually when Floyd fought Connor same night. Um, but he, he like was looking into meditation because his jaw was wired shut. And he's like, he had to control his mind. And like, he kind of would talk to me about it. Like, I think this is actually gonna help, like blah, blah, blah. So I started getting into it. And then we would read books and I think like Tim Ferriss book, Tools of Titans and like all these different entrepreneurs and super successful people mentioned meditation. So I'm like, there's gotta be something to this. So for me, I, I start every single morning out with a 10, at least 10 minute meditation and just quiet in my mind, breathing, following my breath. And I really feel like that's changed my life completely. Just going throughout the day, if something pops up, like I can, you know, be more stoic about it. I don't react right away, like get mad. And I, like I can really see a difference from when I'm, you know, 21 to now that I'm 27. Like I, I feel like that's changed my life a lot. Journaling, I feel like I've been journaling for four years too. I feel like I'm gonna have a crazy book at the end of it. Like if that's some, I read just whatever in, in there. Um, <laughs> journaling? Journaling. What's that? Just, just, you know, how, what, how the day was. <laughs> It's like, you, it's like, it's almost like having a diary, but a diary, it's not a diary. Yeah. It is I mean, a diary. Yeah, yeah, diary. Do y'all have a lock on it? You journal? I don't have a lock no, on I don't it. Journal. Do y'all have a, do you you have put, a little People lock? can't read my writing, so there's, there's no need to lock it. And you and you just I, talk I, I, about your day? I'll, or I'll wake up in the morning and say, hey, let, let's have a good day today. I have mitts at 10 a.m. with Tim. I'm going to come home, make sure I recover, make sure I eat I'm like clean. I'm going to work out with Brandon later at 4. And then maybe I'll journal at night. But like, today was a good day. I feel like for me mentally, that helps me so much. Like everyone talks about anxiety and depression. I think there's so many things that people can do other than take pills and drugs and all this stuff. I feel like for me, meditation, journaling, I have a cold plunge. I've been cold plunging every single night, three minutes for the last four years. And it fing sucks. It never gets easier. Do you get better at being in the cold because you can, you know, cold you, plunge. Cold plunge. Explain that. Yeah. 42 degrees every night, it's just outside, sitting right out you. my door. I got you. Set a timer, three minutes, get in there, follow my breath. And it, every single night, I don't want to do it. Every night. But it's like a mental win every time I do it. I get in there, follow my breath. And uh, I think me, for me, learning how to follow my breath in the cold plunge translates over to me being able to perform every time I get in the octagon. It's the same feeling. I want to get into my breath. I don't want to be busy in my mind. I want to feel, like, feel the oxygen in my stomach and my back and like just get into a good flow, get lost in my breath. I feel like that's kind of how I enter my flow state. And it's a, it's a skill. Like some people that can't show up to fights, they just, they get in their head and they're like, oh, I just had an off night. I don't want to ever have an off night because I can always get into the flow by getting into my breath. And I think I've gotten good at that by getting in the cold plunge every night, by starting my mornings off with meditation. So I think for me, that's a lot of stuff that people don't really see. They see the cars, the hair, all the stuff, yeah. but. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Behind closed doors, your fans don't always get an opportunity to glimpse into that part, you yeah. know, of what you do, the preparation part, yeah. right? But you talk about business, you know, you talk about the marketing and you're smart, seem very smart and calculated. I think most of your fans though, a lot of times fans can't differ differentiate between the two. You know, like when you rap, these guys talk about drugs, guns, yeah. this and that, but then they can go home and be at peace. Yeah. But they're they're selling a they're entertainers. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think your fans would go a different direction if they if they if they couldn't separate the two? I, I think like my diehard fans that listen to my podcast, because Tim and I we will have conversations like we on our podcast we're always kind of like preaching you know let's you know sleep good, hydrate. We talk about meditation. We do. We talk about this this kind of stuff on our podcast. Um, so like the diehard fans kind of see that and, and they know. Um, but for the most part, the the fans, the majority of the fans just see like the flashy stuff and right. you know the character, this and that. Yeah. And, and with that, um, these guys probably don't know because they're not. Geeks like don't, I try don't, to be. Don't act crazy. No, I'm not. Here you go. I'm nah, smart I want to talk about. I want to I want to talk about. If we both come over there, your ass is in trouble. <laughs> nah, because I got my dog sugar yeah. with me. They got my back. Whatever. So, <laughs> talk about Sugar Squad. 
You know, and, and what's your uh, favorite character? I know you say you can assemble over 300,000 of them. The, uh, the NFTs? With the yeah, your NFTs. Yeah, yeah the, the Sugar, Sugar Squad. Squad. I knew you were going to get to right. business like that at some point. I got to talk to him. <laughs> but it's perfect, though. Yeah. To go with the whole persona. I mean, you can create. Yeah. The mint does it itself. Right. But I'm sure, you know, your fans, the followers, whatever, children. The, I mean, that's what's pretty cool about these is we can, we can change them up. Like, I had a fight coming up. We did the hair. You know, so we can we can do that. Yeah, we give away, and we've been since we dropped it. Every month, we're giving away an Oculus. I bought ten tickets oh, to the wow. fights for the the holders, um, fit, like Instagram, Facetimes, like. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, utilities in yeah, ours, which nice. a lot of people d didn't have. So it, it's been good. Um, one time I was in Texas and. Like these guys were sugar squat, like they're holding up their phone at the club and they ended up just hanging out with me all night. Right. Cool kids and they was just literally from buying my NFT and they were, just, they were, they were hanging out. Right. It, it, was, it was cool. Since you couldn't really disclose that UFC uh, money, could you <laughs> talk about what your drop brought you? Well, Ethereum's dog shit now, so. Yeah, it, <laughs> but it, it was December, right? Was your drop? Uh, was yeah, it, in it was, I think it was even before that. It, it brought in, it was good, it did really good, but Ethereum, it's really took a shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Channing talks about his record, right? 74. It always changes. It's 74 yeah. and 3, 78 and yeah. 3, 74 and 4. It's always different. I don't whooped a lot of ass. Yeah, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You haven't washed a lot of ass. You, you, you are nasty as hell. This, this is going to be something for you. So, <laughs> yeah. you, you told I'm like, a story. I'm paper in my ass right Yeah, you're now. disgusting. <laughs> you're disgusting. <laughs> you told a story, bro. Like, like, people try you, right? Like, so, like, I remember. Like being in college, being a football player, yeah. you go out to the bar or whatever, you yeah. drink and they see you drunk. They want to see if you are as tough yeah. as as you see, right? Man, when you walk in, man, like you ain't a big dude, bro. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like uh, I know you told a story before about dude kind of wanting to spar this and that, and you made him, uh, yeah. you made him. He shit himself. Yeah. yeah. Like, is that the only kind of altercation you had like that? Like, how did that even happen? And do yeah. people try that junk all the time? No, that wasn't. That wasn't like a. That was like a guy, pretty jacked guy that just didn't understand. He, he said, you guys make money fighting? We're like, yeah. He's like, how? I want to, like, I could do that. I could fight you guys. I'm like, okay. So it wasn't like a... Like you were trying. It wasn't a violent, like, I'm going to you up. It was like, I was just going to, like, I didn't want to hurt him in the head. I was conscious of, like, I don't want to give this guy a concussion. Mm -hmm. So I just ripped him a couple body kicks, and yeah, he just shit right out of his shorts. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you're, you're good enough at fighting that you say, I can I'm play gonna just, him. Yeah, I, can I can just him. hit him in the body and make him poop on himself. Oh, I, I didn't, I, yeah, I wasn't thinking like I'm gonna try to make him shit himself. I was thinking I'm gonna hit him to the body and make him feel like, oh shit, like I can't just fight and make right. money. Like it is a skill. But yeah, I mean, if I'm a trained professional, like, like an average guy I could just play with him. I could make them. I could beat them up without even hitting them, just by making them so tired of me fainting at them, just constantly flinching, <laughs> that it'd be, I could beat them up without hurting them. And, and I brought up earlier that, uh, that you know, Floyd's our, Floyd's, my, Floyd's our guy, Floyd's our dude. He said having one woman is too close to having no women. <laughs> And I Thank saw, you. it's on Wikipedia, like, you know, Wikipedia to say you have an open marriage. Yeah. What, what does open marriage mean? Because I've been married for 12 years, and I want you to now convince my wife that I can have an open marriage. <laughs> That's a good question. This one I get, I get asked about a lot. Um, Danny, she's obviously in there. It's always easier for me to, when she's talking to, because just from my perspective, it sounds like... You in the streets. She, she's like, the, the first conversation we ever had before we were dating or anything, I think I was 20 years old or something, I was like, I don't understand how someone get married and have sex with one girl the rest of their life. I just don't get that. And like that was like our first conversation. So when we kind of started talking and falling in love, she this was before I had money, before I had a blue check mark, what you know, this was before I was just a normal dude. She fell in love with who I was and who I I, I was never pretending to be. I was never been like, oh no, I only love you. I would never I don't look at other girls, I don't talk to girls. Like, even back then I was like, I still wanted to hook up with other girls, and now it's just we have a really good, we've been together for like seven years. I can hook up with chicks and like, it's not like an issue. It's like, so we'll hook open, up with chicks together. Is open, open for the both of you? She's 100%, I, I don't, the way I look at it is I don't own her. I don't have, possess her. Like if she wanted to hook up with another guy, I would, wouldn't judge her. I wouldn't, you know, that's what she wants to experience. Why would I judge her for that? I want to hook up with other chicks. Like, 
The tricky part is when it gets emotional. That's where like we've had ups and downs, and we always come out on the other end better. So I feel like our love is even deeper because of the mistakes. I don't even know if you want to call them mistakes. The the stuff I've done, where I would hook up with a girl and then I'd be like, kind of get emotional and like, that's when it gets rocky. And then I, you know, that we we had broke up before. This was years ago, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm like, that's not what I want. I do want to be with Danny. We worked it out, talked it out. Communication, it's hard to have com uncomfortable conversations with right. your partner because you don't want them to feel a certain way But at the end of the day, you can't control how they feel they're gonna feel like their emotions are come from within themselves, so it, It's it's super tricky and it's easier to talk about when she's with me because then you get her perspective of it, too And she's very very smart and she's been through a lot and she's learned a lot books podcasts like there's there's information on open relationships people have been doing it for a long time so there's a lot of information you can learn from other people, and I've, we've both done that. Yeah, your happiness is everything. Uh, I have a daughter. She's just a few years younger than you, and uh, I've always prided myself in how I treat or how I've treated women. And, uh, you know, with Shannon and, and Ryan, the things you can look up on the Internet, with women, you're talking about open relationship, multiple women, or what have you. You have a, a new daughter, mm -hmm. right? Do you ever think when you're hooking up, do you ever think about her and, you know, what it might be like if she sees this later on in life or you're just young? Say, hey, look, I got to live this, get it out of my system. You know, what's your parenting approach and all of it? Just showing her love is, I feel like, the most important thing. Um, and, and I think that she's going to learn a lot from our relationship. It's not like I'm bringing multiple girls around her all the time, yeah, too, and you. stuff. Uh, so if like, say say we live in Arizona and I'm going to LA cause I gotta do uh, some media and stuff and I, meet a, I find this hot chick, like I hook up with her, it's no issue. Like there's nothing, I don't feel like um, there's anything wrong with that. I don't feel guilty. I'm just, you know, I'm wearing protection, I'm safe. I'm not getting her pregnant, I'm not getting the disease. Like it's, and I just had fun. And then I fly back and it's like, I could have not done that, but why wouldn't I have? Because I feel guilty, but I shouldn't feel guilty. I'm, it's just sex, it's just, you know what I mean? But uh, for the parenting thing, I'm just going with the flow. I think Elena will, uh, I think Elena will learn what true love is in a relationship rather than a monogamous relationship when a lot of parents stay together because it's easier to stay together than it is to have a conversation and get a divorce and it's just like marriage contract is pretty fucked up honestly it's like it all comes from religion too so i think elena will see what a real true love relationship is and i think she'll grow up with a very unique perspective on it are, are you are you nasty man because me and my um we're in orlando right now oh, i'm gonna fly geez. back to orlando i gotta ask him to tomorrow so me and my wife so we have an airbnb in orlando uh -huh. And it has a big backyard, and it's like on a canal. So we had sex in the grass, Fire. and to put the kids to bed, and yeah. we found the kids to bed. So once the kids were to bed, we rolled around in that grass. It's just like it, it's just Fire. it's more to it about that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Are you like nasty about it? Because to have an open relationship, like I think open relationship means like you got to get after it. So you can't just sit missionary and just uh, lean on somebody and breathe hard. You, yeah. you 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 go to, like your hair is pink and green. Do you pink and green sex a mother? <laughs> if I'm super horned up, yeah. You can I go. mean we can get yeah, it depends how horned up you are. Sometimes you know there's level of horned upness. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that night horned you were up horned up. Yeah. So you got extra freaky. Sometimes you just like it's just like you're horny, you just wanna fucking bust a nut and, and you know what I mean? So I think if I'm super horned up, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, we can, yeah, we can. Well, when you're in camp, we talked to Earl Spence before he his, uh, one of his last, his last big fights, right? Ooh, guys, yeah. right. And he said he ain't having sex during camp. He ain't fucking around. Yeah. You, your same mindset? Oh, God. I, uh, <laughs> Don't call him now. No. <laughs> I, I think, so you gotta save your chi, you know, that energy. When you bust, you, you release chi. One time before uh, sparring, and this is probably why some people save it. Uh, Danny and I had a girl over, and I busted three times <laughs> before. Yeah. Be this guy is 27. Yeah, before, you must be 27. Like my hardest rounds of camp. So I did three sparring rounds with a fresh partner each round, three five minute rounds, which is hard. And I busted three times that night, 
and the next morning I woke up and I was just like, I didn't want to, I did not want to train. So the reason some people don't have sex is still they don't feel like that. Three times was maybe a little excessive, but um, this camp, I didn't, it's weird too when you're training as hard as I am and I have to diet, so I have to cut, I have to burn more calories. I have to cut, like slowly get from 158 to like 156 to 154 to like throughout the weeks. So when I'm training super hard and I'm not eating as much as I technically probably should be because you're, I gotta make weight, you're not as horned up. Like I, I, all that energy is going towards training, going towards recovery. So it's not like when I'm outside of camp and I'm carved up and I'm, I'll f wake up with a boner all day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so out of camp, I'm, I'm definitely more horned, horny and just like, so I'm either old or too black because I've never heard horned up. I don't even know, like, I don't even know how, does he just I walk up it. to Danny one morning and be like, shit, boo, I'm horned up as hell. Like, what you trying to do, you know? Yeah, I, I, be, I beat my meat a second ago <laughs> before the show. Yeah, in between. That's when, that, that's when they was texting me. They were like, hurry up. I was well, back sometimes there. you got to just get it out so you can think straight. Yeah, yeah. Because if, yeah. like, if you're fucking horny and you got shit to do, like, sometimes you just got to and get it done with, and then you can finally focus on the task at hand. Yeah, because I, I, I know how to love me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I make love, but I love me, too. Yeah. Like, he don't, he don't take baths, so like, he thinks that two baths a week are excessive. Wash twice a week, man. Uh, you have a bidet, at least? A bidet? <laughs> yeah. When the water skeet up in your ass? Yep. No, I can't have nobody skeet up in my ass. <laughs> if you sit, if you try a bidet, you don't want to go back. With the saying? water that squirts in your Just booty. Just a little, yeah. That, that's, what not I get. that's what I would expect to get from a Cowboys fan. Because <laughs> they, all the Cowboys the, fans stuck in the 90s. And What's the, up with that, man? I, growing up, I was a huge Broncos fan, actually. Yeah. Gro my little brother was, I mean, he still is a huge Cowboys fan, but yeah, growing up, I was a huge Denver fan. Okay. All right. Yeah. So no Cowboys. But uh, the, the Cowboys, I don't know. I like them. Well, you know, you know what happens though, Freddie T. Man, he was the the guy with just brown hair from yeah, Montana, yeah. and now he's sugar, yeah. right? Like you can't, like sugar can't be a Denver fan. Like he got to go to the place where all the stars at. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Alicia's there, uh, Conor yeah, McGregor's uh, there, uh, uh, yeah. Jamie Foxx is that's there. You know true. that that that's the type of type of vibe uh, he had to be on. I'd be a Cardinals fan too, living in AZ. Yeah, see. That's yeah, cool. uh, Joe Burrow. He said you're his favorite. We partied last night. I met him last fighter. night. Good yeah. dude. Yeah, it's crazy how young he is too. The LSU uh, guy. Yeah. Another LSU guy. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's true. He's an LSU guy, but you guys are next in line to really uh, push the culture, man. You're gonna, yeah. you that's know, crazy with social about. media, the whole thing. Your your guys are gonna be looked upon as the superstars of this generation. Yeah. You ready for it? I think so. I think uh, I've had like a slow, gradual increase of fame, and uh, it's been a. Uh, I've learned how to deal with it rather than just kind of overnight. To where, because I can see how it people, for mm -hmm. sure. And you can yeah. see how some people act like. What, some people are just, they think they can't, they're just better than everyone else because yeah. they're famous or whatever. And I've been around those type of people, not enjoyable to be right. around. For and sure. I feel like getting famous slowly helped me transition and just like be okay with it and, and understand like, it's not that, I I'm know, the same person. I know Channing has something for you, but whenever you get a moment, and we, our show with Mike Tyson has been shadow banned due to some stuff we had <laughs> on the thing, but, Check that episode out if you have a moment. Yeah, yeah of right? course. Mike talks about great people versus good people. And everything you just said, he hits it right on the head. And it'll, I think it'll actually help you in your journey, you know, in, in whatever direction you're going to take in life. Because Mike went through a lot of shit. Yeah. My know? favorite book I've ever listened to was uh, The Undisputed Truth. Got it. it was the Mike Tyson book. And that was, I don't think anyone's lived a crazier life than that dude. And listening to that book, was insane, like it was, the ups and downs he right. went through, and and for him to come out and be where he is today, yeah. is in, yeah. is is wild. We had a great time with him. Yeah. Check it out when you. I definitely well, he did. Moment. He said um, the thing that got me. He said good people talk about themselves. No, good people talk about others. Everybody. Great else, people right. talk great about people, themselves. Yeah. yeah, great people raise others yeah. up. And what, yeah. and what but he's no, basically no, saying is like no, greats get involved in with 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 themselves and what they've accomplished, whereas great. good humans see what other people around them have done to kind of help them be who they are, but also uh, elevate them above mm -hmm. self. Go ahead. Yeah. Bro, the, the face tattoos. 
Like we we got to, we all tatted up. Like yeah. RC just pulled his tattoos out. He recently. pulled the guns out. He for was you. he he was hiding his tattoos for <laughs> months. But the face tattoos, like when, when like what what what's the peak? Cause I would not get a face tattoo, and I'm tatted up everywhere. A little star on your cheek, it looks. No, I, it doesn't. It, it would. Does. I gotta show this shit off. Yeah, this I was new, just trying to cover up other. When did the face tattoo start? Um, the star was the first one. It was my second fight in the UFC. I was on the pay per view. I felt like a fucking superstar, and like I said, I think of an idea, I get it the next day. So, went and got the star. Um, the next one I got on. I'm on my forehead up here, it says, like, if you look in the mirror, it says breathe. Um, that was when I was going through the two-year layoff with my foot. It was just like, I don't know, it was a good reminder. Look in the mirror in case you forget how to breathe. Or you're not breathing. Mind you, breathe. <laughs> but that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you can, you can do that <laughs> mentally if you want. Yeah, <laughs> you can. I that too. That's true. Um, third one, I think it was the sugar one, or whatever the that one it is like on one right in case right I forget out. my name uh, <laughs> the fourth one was a, a heart no reason the, uh, the heart next to the love yeah or the love with the love heart love was the last one I got okay. what reason love you caught fire like at least for me during COVID yeah right? uh, same time uh, Hamza Chimaya yeah kind of caught fire as well uh, we watched the UFC push him up to fight Gilbert Burns, who I believe was number two yeah. in the rankings at the time. And you mentioned the slow burn you've been going through or going, you know, having to kind of take to get to yeah. fame or to get to stardom. Do you ever watch some of these other people and try to figure out why not me? Like, like why is the UFC not elevating me or giving me that chance? Like, you just came out, like, why ain't nobody calling me out? Yeah, you know I think saying? if you look at how much he's made compared to how much I've made, mm -hmm. I've made quite a bit more and I fought quite a bit less Okay. skilled guys so for me it's a business it's like I've made over a million dollars fighting guys that aren't in the top 15 mm -hmm. he's fighting his whatever fight for probably not that much money he's fighting Gilbert Burns right like if you want me to fight number two or three four ranked right guy my third fourth fight in the UFC I'm not fighting for 40 and 40 like I need to make get paid good right so I think when I look at those guys it's like I they I, I like that's not smart you should be getting paid bigger to fight those big name guys, and uh, I'm sure he's not getting, wasn't getting paid that crazy amount. So I, I, I don't think of it like that. I, I think of it as like, yeah, make, what I've done, fighting the guys for the money I fought makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you look at UFC 276 uh, card, you want obviously things don't go the way that that you wanted them to go with the no contest, but. You mentioned Izzy and, and, and Volk getting parts of a piece of the, the mm -hmm. pay-per-view. But just their performances, you know, you think, you know, it's Alexander Volkanovsky and Max Holloway, yeah. right? We the, the first two fights, highly competitive. Some people thought Max won the yeah. second fight. And last night, Volk is 100% dominant. Yeah. You know, when you look at those guys as champions, what do you see about their performances last night that makes you say, okay, you know, here, here's where I have to work, here's what they did, now how do I elevate to that position? Yeah, it's inspiring seeing a champion like Izzy and Volk defend the belt again and again and again. To be able to mentally stay in the game, it's a, like camps are tough, camps are long, it's like a long, disciplined, and for them to do it, even Kamaru Usman to defend the belt over and over again, it's super ins inspiring. Um, yeah, I just know that I'm capable of becoming champ and doing that too. You just gotta stay locked in, dialed in, and surround yourself with the right people, not get lost in the in the sauce. Not get lost in LA, Miami, Vegas. Like I gotta I live in Peoria, Arizona. Like it's not it's like an old town, older people place. Like I live out there for a reason. Like I'm twenty minutes away from both the gyms I go to. Um, you know, I am I'm home. Like for the next couple weeks I'll probably I'll probably travel, do some podcasts, but for the most part like, I'm home, I'm training, I'm getting better, and I'm improving, mm. because I do know I'm, I'm 27, I'm, I got maybe, let's say, 10 years left. By the time I'm 40, I don't wanna look back and be like, damn, I wish I would've just, like, gave it more. Like, that haunts me, I do not wanna do that. And, and I, I wanna make sure I give everything I have for the next 10 years to be able to say at least I fucking tried to be right. the greatest of all time. We we were uh, we spoke with DC offline, <clears throat> just you know congratulating on being inducted into the Hall of Fame, 
and uh, he spoke about today's athletes are much are very smart, much yeah. smarter, yeah. certainly much smarter than we were. You're 27, and this business approach. I'm just sitting over here, like and all, like I, I love it. Um, you understand every aspect of it all, from self marketing, the business self, uh, uh, pay per view, the whole yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Most fi fighters just want to fight, yeah, and let their partners do that. Yeah, uh, does it help your relationship with the UFC? And, and, and Dana, because a lot of guys tend to talk bad about it. Yeah. Right? But your relationship seems to be in good standing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think recently, in the last six, seven months, um, kind of having that perspective change and being like, okay, I'm not, it's not me versus UFC. It's me and the UFC together. The more money I can make them, the more money they can pay me. And Emron, who you guys met, really, really kind of helped me develop that mindset. And, uh, He's, he's like, hey, let's meet with Dana, let's meet with Hunter, let's meet with Sean, let's build a relationship with them. And we, we have sat down with them, I've had dinner with them and built a relationship, a genuine, like a real one. And it's really changed, um, like, yeah, how, how I view the UFC and how I'm a partner with the right. UFC. Um, I do all, Emron and I do all our own brand deals. I don't have a, a manager. I talk to the UFC, I do my own deals with the UFC. Um, I'm on every single call with, with all the brands, like I want to be in the middle of that, but like you said, some people just want to fight, yeah. right. and like that's that's their choice. They're they're definitely losing money in, if they just do that, but they might enjoy life more. Right. I enjoy the business side of it. I think it's fun. Like right. for me, even if it is a little bit stressful, it, it's like a fun stress. It's a good stress. It's uh, you know, I've learned so much jumping on these calls and doing like doing all these. Like meeting with the UFC and negotiating my own contract, sitting mm -hmm. down with Sean, and you know he says this, I'm like, yeah, but like I think this, and like get, get into a middle ground, like that's fun, it's like a fun, fun thing to do, and and I think it's like me and Sean have a really good relationship, which is which is super important. Like we're gonna work together for the next ten years. Right, you have the right approach. We we sat down with Garrett Wilson, New York Jets first round uh, wide receiver, and one of the things that we talked to him about was not having that us versus them. Yeah. You know, attitude and mindset, you know, going, being able to approach the, the front office and ownership and being able to talk out. A lot of times you can negotiate your contract through a great relationship yeah. with the team more so than your agent in there talking for 100%. you. So I, I think that is extremely vital and I think you're taking the right approach. So keep going. Yeah, man. appreciate that. It's crazy sure. too. Like if the UFC gets a deal with a brand um, and that brand wants to sign someone or sign someone in the UFC, the UFC will say, okay, who's Sean's manager? These guys, okay, I wanna go tell them. And then that manager tells us, comes to me, and they take 20% for right. being a middleman. Right. Literally doing nothing other than relaying the message. 95% right. of, maybe even higher, of the guys in the UFC still do that. Like, they don't, I don't even know if they know, like, it's pretty easy. If, if you're, if you got extra time, most fighters do, it's like, we train a couple times a day, but for the most part, like we have a lot of free time. We can sit down and think about some shit that's important, yeah. you know. I think I think the the way the way you look at it and the relationships you have built, I believe you see that through the way you're promoted as well. You know, I'm sitting in there, you know, last night and and you know, you get a video. Mm -hmm. You know, uh Jared Cannonier barely had videos yeah. and he's fighting for the championship. So you can see how those relationships, and Fred talks about relationships all the time because the world revolves around yeah. relationships yeah. and you're in a relationship business, but you're looking at yourself and saying, okay, I'm a partner with the UFC. I believe anyone you ask who covers the sport, follows the sport, believe you're one of the people that are up next. What are some of the other young guys you look at, or even women you look at that are fighting right now that you say, you know how now we sit we sit at home and it's like, okay, you know Volk, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying, you know Izzy, you know, you know Amanda, you know Valentina. What are gonna be some of those names in five years along with Sugar Sean that we're looking at like, okay, this dude can go. Uh, Hamza, the one mm -hmm. you mentioned, definitely Patty. I yeah. think Patty's doing a good job. Um, just loud, obnoxious, like right. stupid ass haircut, <laughs> right. like gets fat as shit. Like people, just random little things like that people are, get atta uh, attracted to, they mm -hmm. want to watch. But just being characters, but at the end of the day also putting on performances, right. like putting on a fucking show, mm -hmm. making people want to watch you. Um, I don't really think there's that many people that, really? that I can look at and be like, damn, these guys are going to be like a superstar. Mm -hmm. At least I don't see anyone. Um, you know, like I said, Patty's doing a good job, Hamza, I haven't heard much of him lately, um, 
But we was in a war with, with Gilbert. So yeah, think, yeah. So, so that probably things, humbled him a bit. Yeah, so <laughs> those, those things way. take time. When, yeah. You know, you, you have, you know, we have Juliana and Amanda yep. coming up. They yep. think that's July 30th in Dallas. And, you know, we sat down with Juliana, and she said she started from, like, a cardio kickboxing yeah. class and, you know, body image issues and different things like that. You spoke about the way, uh, you know, you started and got involved in it. I mean, you know... I wouldn't, like, there's no way I would go home, right, and read your story and go, man, what Sugar Sean did, all you kids should do, yeah. right? If you don't like school, oh, drop out of high school and go <laughs> fight, because you're yeah. going to be able to fight. Like, like that's yeah, not the way. Drop at, out of high school. No, I know, but I'm saying. Like, I was going to say, yeah, Sean, like, that's not the way to go, bro. Best decision he made. <laughs> that wasn't the best decision he made. Why, why would you say that? This is you a new world. drop out of high school. This is a new world. Bro, it's, it's different. No, you what, what, what's the end game? The hell you looking at Get your GED. What's the end? Get your, he got get your out. damn. I diploma. think he got in a fight or something. You got in a fight and you got kicked out. I got. I went. I bounced around through for a, like a lot of different high schools. I went. Ended up going to this thing called like Montana Youth Challenge, like a like a boot camp, like a military based thing. It was supposed to be six months. Lasted like a month and a half. Just did not do good with authority. People tell me what to do. Um, and I wanted a kickbox. I'm like, I don't know why I gotta be doing all this other shit when I could be going to the gym and getting good at something that I want to get good at. So for me, going to school was like. Like, I don't care about Algebra 2. I can add, subtract, got a calculator, I'm good. I don't need to do all this other bullshit, find an X and Y and Z, like, yeah. still don't. What, what's your definition of success? And you, what, what's you your definition? Need, you need I'm not high school. I think that's the basic thing, that's the basis Says of education. Who? Yeah. Says who? Yeah. Says me. But why are you well, setting who, that Who are you to say it? He's chanting. I'm a bad <laughs> mother. <laughs> See, that's the point I'm trying I'm to make. Saying, but, and by but any means, to I have, I have high kids, school, right? Fred, uh -huh. that's not, and I try no. and push and encourage them to attain a certain level of education, yeah. what they see is that. Yeah. So I'm not condoning dropping out of high school, yeah. but I'm also not going to sit here and say that you need to have a high school education to go out there and be, enjoy and be happy in life. Yeah. Be successful. And, and be self-fulfilled. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to ever say that. Fred, right? everybody because, can choke a bitch to sleep. But what it, but <laughs> that's what he does is that's choke true. bitches to sleep. But that was his And path. kick bitches in the face. Yeah. And he just this said, is what I'm telling you. That's I was his gonna path. Say, but but, but is, is that the normal path? No, you need but a high school normal. Education. But we're in 2022. But the point, the point no. I was making is, but the point I was making is, if you look at Sean's story, that's not the story you go sell to exactly. people. Right. But he has now, he has now learned right through experience and things. Like you think about the way he talked about parenting his daughter. She's gonna learn love through the way we live, through the way I love her. I think it's the same thing about education. He knew and understood what he wanted to do. A lot of times when you are forced to drop out of these things happen, it's because you can't do it, not because you don't want to. And so I think that, that that's a different part of the story. But right. for you, for you, Sean, you know, I think, you know, because we're going to let you go in a few, you're an, you're, you're an enigma and an anomaly all at once, right? In the sense that sitting here talking to you, I couldn't imagine this, imagine this conversation. And I listen to a lot of stuff, you know, that you do. I mean, shoot, you were on with DC mm -hmm. and you got hot with DC because you was like, dog, I don't know why you saying people could just leg kick me or this and that, like, yeah. like those different things. And I was expecting to be in here and be like, oh yeah, Sean's gonna tell us some of these stories. It's gonna be, but it's been so much more educational than that. What is the end goal for you though? Uh, end goal. Like career wise or yeah. just There's, no life wise. I don't life like wise? The, the the career is what it is and you know, as much work as you could put into it, you can't guarantee mm -hmm. that on that night you wear the belt. All you can yeah. do is prepare yourself yeah. for it. Some of the more tangible things that are totally in your control, like what do you want to show Elena? What do you want to show Danny? Like what do you want to show your family? Who do you want to ultimately end up being from that kid that did decide, you know what, algebra two ain't for me. It's another <laughs> route. Yeah, I want to just, I feel like I'm doing a good job at, you know, being a good dad. Like, Elena's here in Vegas. She, we flew Danny's mom out, and she, she's watching her. So when I'm doing stuff like this, like, she's watching right now. We don't have her. Uh, we saw her this morning. But continue to be a good dad, a good partner to Danny. Um, you know, maybe have more kids. I don't know. Elena was an accident, like a blessing in disguise, like a perfect time to where I was like, like made a lot of money getting popular and like she just grounded me kept me humble just like made me just change kind of change my life slowly but uh I, I feel like i might want more kids build a little tribe and like <laughs> you know have have a little tribe um but yeah just continuing to be 
be able to say like I'm I'm happy. It's like uh, so a lot of people can't they don't they can't say it and genuinely mean it. Um, but I think for me, just continuing to have good routines, like continuing to do my journaling, meditation, my cold plunge, being home. Um, I want to continue doing that. Like, if I can continue doing that, I know that I'll be able to maintain a level of happiness. I want to ask you, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, was going down to, to, to Arizona the most pivotal moment or your biggest pivot in your life? That was huge. That was, it, it completely, and I, I didn't feel like I, I, I knew I was supposed to do it. Like, I remember driving from Helena, left at like 6 a.m., and I drove, I was driving through Butte, which was like two hours, and I think I cried the entire time. Like, I was like pretty scared, never left, never moved to, or lived without my parents. Didn't know how to do laundry or dishes, or like, you know, I was going down to live with Tim, who's my head coach now, and I was just kind of, I had only met him for the 10 days that I had went previously. So I saved up $2,000, paid off my car, packed it, 2006 Nissan Altima, still got it, um, and drove down, and that was like, powerful I, mean, I drove straight through all the way to phoenix and i was like just knew it was the right move I, I didn't ever think back i didn't i got a little homesick but i never even questioned like moving back i knew where i needed to be because i was getting beat up i was losing every time i went into the gym i was losing rather than in montana every practice i was winning like that's not where i need to be if i want to get good so yeah it was it was the most pivotal moment of my life for sure moving from montana to phoenix you seem to be a uh, very strong will, very strong minded. What's your faith like? Um, I grew up Christian. Like, it was just kind of forced on me. Like, I always like to ask someone who's. Most of the time it is. Yeah, I, I always like to ask somebody who's super religious, either Christian, Mormon, whatever, uh, Muslim. Like, if you were born a, into a different religion, your parents, would you be that religion? And the answer is, yeah, yeah. probably. You wouldn't have found a different one because you would have just grew up with that one. So I grew up Christian and was always questioning, like, this God thing just doesn't really make sense, at least not the way that they're, you know, kind of explaining it to me. I don't really understand it. It didn't, it didn't ever make sense to me. I went through a phase where I was like, like, I like got super against religion. Like, that's so stupid. That's fucked up. You're going to brainwash me and tell me if I don't believe in God, I'm going to go to hell. And I'm five years old, six years old. Like, you have to believe in God or you're going to hell. Like, that's not a way to, like, teach someone about Christianity or whatever religion you want to teach them about by f it's fear-based like mm -hmm. most religions like I'm scared of death. I don't want to go to hell. I'm gonna believe in God and And it can be good for some people because it can make make them a good person I feel like I'm a good person. And I don't believe in God. I don't believe in at least that kind of God I don't, I don't know what I believe in. I don't know where we're going after this I just know if I can be a good person now that if there is a heaven and hell God knows I'm trying to be a good person. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't necessarily pray. I, you know, I talk to myself. I, I feel like I talk to my higher self, like my best self. Sometimes, like when before I go into the fights, I feel like I get into that flow. I feel like I completely unattach myself from my everything. I just feel like my higher self takes over, um, and that's kind of like my God in a sense. Um, but yeah, religion is a is a tricky conversation because, mm -hmm. like, my mom is so. Like, I try to have a conversation with her. She gets so defensive and just, like, will kind of, like, just get fired up. And even if I try to have a like, calm conversation with her and ask her questions about God that she doesn't know, that she doesn't want to think about. So she gets fired up, and then she like, walk away or leave. But, yeah, religion is a, is a tricky one. All right. Do you pray before fights? Even, even when you were questioning it, do you pray before fights? Is there something that you pray for or somebody... I don't know the higher power that you pray to before a fight. Um, I don't really have a conversation with anyone, like any anything other than myself. Like, I, I going into fights, I'm like it's gonna play out however it plays out, and I'm not attached to the outcome. If I would have lost, it would have sucked. But I have Danny and Elena and my family. I'm not like losing to me isn't isn't the most terrifying thing ever. Like I go back to Phoenix. I'll get in my Lamborghini, I'll drive to the gym, and I'll be okay. Like, I'm not, you know what I mean? Always hope, so you yeah. get in the Lamborghini, dog. I would have been fine. I would have been fine. The so Lambo? I would, hey, I would feel it it makes you feel better to get in the Lambo. I mean, it probably would have if I would have lost, and I would have went home, sit in my Lambo, back. hey, life's not too bad. But I'm not scared of losing, so I, I'm not really praying. I'm, I'm like, t I talk to myself, like, let's get in there and just do what, what I know I'm capable of doing, that's knocking people out. And if it doesn't happen, like, I'll fight again. Like, I, I don't really pray, like, keep me safe or, like, yeah. I, I don't know if that, 
I mean, I definitely used to pray, used to like, but I, I, I don't know. My, I feel like my parents kind of, like religion just wasn't the way I was taught about it, and or yeah, taught, and it's just I didn't like it. I think I think I'm I'm from the South, and I grew up Southern Baptist, and I get it. You know, my mom still to this day every morning I get a Bible verse, I get uh, <laughs> a, a, a song, uh, a gospel song, and and that's how I grew up, and mm -hmm. that's what I, and that's what I believe. I believe I believe in prayer, but I also believe that there are so many people that believe in quote unquote religion, right? Mm -hmm. Religion becomes a regimen of doing things that are people I don't want to be like. Yeah. You know, so I get that. I and mean, I think the biggest thing I want to say to you, bro, is I only got to watch you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and see you from the outside and listen to you continue to build this brand, which is a monster. But it was truly a revelation, man, to sit down with you, listen to how your mind works. And like I told you on Saturday, I said it, I was like, stop looking at this dude and his hair and his tattoos and not understanding the type of skill that, that you possess, man. So thank you for sitting yeah, down, man. Yeah. Shout out to Happy Dad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Partners with all of us, man. Uh, best of luck. Uh, we hope to see you in there soon. We talked about September, December. Yep. I know Dana yep. will get you back right, man, but we really appreciate you. Yeah, no, thank you guys. This is honestly one of the most fun podcasts I've ever been a part of, so really appreciate, appreciate you guys. It. Yeah, My thank man, you. thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Jesus yes, is on the main line. <laughs> Tell him what you want. Yeah, Jesus is on the main line. Sure. Nah, no, what you gonna oh, do? He said he got Thank you, Hold up. Limitless, take a semi cap, pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Get my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless, take a semi cap, pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Get my people feeling militant.